Nothing about school is what it seems, not even boredom. To show you what I mean is the burden of this long essay. My book represents a try at arranging my own thoughts in order to figure out what 50 years of classroom confinement as student and teacher add up to for me. You'll encounter a great deal of speculative history here. This is a personal investigation of why school is a dangerous place. It's not so much that anyone there sets out to hurt children, more that all of us associated with the institution are stuck like flies in the same great web your kids are. We buzz frantically to cover our own panic, but have little power to help smaller flies. Looking backward on a 30-year teaching career full of rewards and prizes, somehow I can't completely believe that I spent my time on earth institutionalized. I can't believe that centralized schooling is allowed to exist at all as a gigantic indoctrination and sorting machine robbing people of their children. Did it really happen? Was this my life? God help me. School is a religion. Without understanding the holy mission aspect, you're certain to misperceive what takes place as a result of human stupidity or venality or even class warfare. All are present in the equation. It's just that none of these matter very much. Even without them, school would move in the same direction. Dewey's Pedagogic Creed Statement of 1897 gives you a clue to the zeitgeist. Every teacher should realize he is a social servant set apart for the maintenance of the proper social order and the securing of the right social growth. In this way, the teacher is always the prophet of the true God and the usher in of the true kingdom of heaven. What is proper social order? What does right social growth look like? If you don't know, you're like me, not like John Dewey who did, or John D. Rockefeller, his patron, who did too. Somehow, out of the industrial confusion which followed the Civil War, powerful men and dreamers became certain what kind of social order America needed. This realization didn't arise as a product of public debate as it should have in a democracy, but as a distillation of private discussion. Their ideas contradicted the original American charter, but that didn't disturb them. They had a stupendous goal in mind, the rationalization of everything the end of unpredictable history and its transformation into something orderly. From mid-century onward, certain utopian schemes to retard maturity in the interest of a greater good were put into play, following roughly the blueprint Rousseau laid down in the book Emile, at least rhetorically. The first goal, to be reached in stages, was an orderly, scientifically managed society, one in which the best people would make the decisions unhampered by democratic tradition. After that, human breeding, the evolutionary destiny of the species, would be in reach. Universal, institutionalized, formal, forced schooling was a prescription, extending the dependency of the young well into what had traditionally been early adult life. Individuals would be prevented from taking up important work until a relatively advanced age. Maturity was to be inhibited. During the post-Civil War period, childhood was extended about four years. Later, a special label was created to describe very old children. It was called adolescence, a phenomenon hitherto unknown to the human race. The infantilization of young people didn't stop at the beginning of the 20th century. Child labor laws were extended to cover more and more kinds of work. The age of school leaving sat higher and higher. The greatest victory for this utopian project was making school the only avenue to certain occupations. The intention was ultimately to draw all work into the school net. By the 1950s, it wasn't unusual to find graduate students well into their 30s running errands, waiting to start their lives.